Well, I did, did remember, uh, just introductory bit of a talk, that there was this one monk many years ago over in Thailand, and you know, he gave many, many talks, he was very popular, very simple living, and eventually somebody got so jealous of him that they concocted, they took some of the things which he said, and they accused him of being a communist at that time. And that was really against the law. And so that he eventually went to jail for two or three years. And when he went to jail, afterwards they all found that it was just, he was set up. But he said it was one of the best times of his life. He didn't have to give any talks. He didn't have to travel over the world to give talks. <laughs> he didn't need to sort of solve people's problems. All he did was just had lovely food in the morning, a beautiful cell to meditate in, and oh, it was such rest and relaxation for him. And I really respect somebody like that. Eventually they found out he was mistreated, it was wrong, he shouldn't have been sentenced in the first place. But nevertheless, he never complained. He saw that as an opportunity to actually to have a retreat for two years. So if I do get go over time, please can I volunteer to be the one who goes to jail so I can have a bit of a rest? You deserve it. Yeah, deserve it, yeah. I mean, deserve to go to jail or deserve to have a rest? Same, same. Same, same. <laughs> <laughs> okay. This is actually the title of the talk this evening, is having a ceasefire with the mind. And this is what we mean by a ceasefire. It not means obliterating the enemies. It does not mean just you know, escaping somewhere else. It just means being where you are, seeing it in a different way, and solving so many of your problems that way. So that's what would happen if you did uh, somehow, somebody invited me to jail, and he was uh, a judge. Thank you so much. You know, I have been into jail many times, you know, teaching meditation. And of course, the first time I went to one of those jails to teach meditation, that was so many years ago. I was really impressed by the population in the jail. It was only a small regional jail in Australia, but nevertheless, was about 104 criminals were staying there. And it was high security. And when I went in there to give a talk on Buddhism, about 101 or 102 of those prisoners turned up to listen to my talk. I thought, my goodness, that I always thought that these were bad people. I didn't realize how they loved spirituality or Buddhism or meditation. And because so many turned up for my talk, many more than are here this evening, and these were prisoners. And so I was so impressed. I really try to give my best possible talk. And after about five minutes, one of the prisoners stood up, held up his hand and said, is it okay if I can ask a question? And this was a really big prisoner, very tall, scars all over him. And when somebody that big and scary asked you, can I ask you a question? He said, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> you know what his question was? His question was, but I've heard that through meditation, you can learn how to fly over walls. <laughs> Is that true? And I said, well, yeah, it takes a lot of practice to fly over the walls, and only a few people can learn how to levitate. It takes many years. And you can see the people in the room were very disappointed. And the next time I went to that prison to give a talk, only three people turned up. That's what they wanted to do. They wanted to learn how to levitate, not because to make life better for themselves, so they could get out of jail whenever they wanted. But, you know, there was this one fellow, and there's no reason why he would lie to me. He said that he was from Yugoslavia. This was before Yugoslavia separated into different republics. And when he was in Yugoslavia as a young kid, you know, he got very, very sick. And they, the 
doctors there gave him an operation and this was one of those cases where someone died on the operating table and he remembers floating above his body on the table he was only like a five or six year old kid at the time and he knew intuitively the doctors were looking at the wrong part of his body and of course he could not speak you know he was like a spirit hovering above his body and then he just wished one of the doctors don't look over there look over here and immediately you know, he could influence that doctor's mind and the doctor turns his attention saw where the real problem was and said this is the problem over here and so those doctors saw what was wrong and uh, solved the problem and he came to again he survived the operation he said from that time on he could always leave his body whenever he wanted so he told me that being in jail was no problem at all whenever he wanted to watch a movie he would simply leave his body sit in his cell and to float out to the cinema if he wanted to watch a cricket match he would just go he didn't have to pay he just floated there and floated and watched the cricket match or the soccer match wherever it was and no one knew that he was absent his body was there his mind was somewhere else so he's a very happy prisoner <laughs> so if anyone could do that it's a true story I, if i'm if i make any stories up i will let you know they're called jokes <laughs> but these are real stories so those are the sorts of things which you can see happen in life there's no reason he should tell me a lie what he was saying and it was a fascinating about you know, our human life and how this mind is something which is way, way greater than the body. And maybe to have a ceasefire with the mind is learning just to understand and recognize this mind, understand its limitations and its, its strengths. And then you can have a much easier, better, happier life, a more productive life. But the first of all is trying to convince people that there actually is a mind and what is it you know in i was just talking with uh Ayachanda earlier that even if anybody um, has studied even philosophy that even pythagoras you know well, pythagoras is theorem but he did much more than just teach maths and he said in one of his books that all his knowledge came from india I don't know if he ever went there, but just that statement was saying something very powerful. You may not have heard that before because no one wants you to know that. But also, even Aristotle, if you read his works, you will find out. Are there any professors of, of philosophy here? Okay. Uh, well, I, I'll tell this one. So I'll go back to Aristotle in a moment. There was a professor of philosophy at Bristol University and he heard that someone was opening up a five-star restaurant, a Michelin five stars, here in Bristol. So he made an appointment, not an appointment so much as a reservation. And the people of the restaurant said, it's a three-month waiting list. He said, I don't mind, he said, I like my food. We got a five, Michelin five-star chef visiting Bristol, put my name down. And so he waited and waited. And after three months, his reservation came up. So he had to dress really fancily, you know, in a nice suit and tie. And he uh, turned up at the restaurant and they said, can I see your ID, sir? And so he showed the idea, yes, you have a reservation, please come inside. And they took him inside this amazing restaurant. It's much better than McDonald's or Burger King. <laughs> when they took him inside the restaurant, this maitre d took him to the table, and the table was just mahogany, and the chair was just so well designed. And it was a, a slight light, like a big uh, standard lamp there. 
not just lights like here, it was subdued, give it atmosphere, but also enough to see and read the menu, which this butler presented to him. A real butler, a nice bow tie and a nice a long jacket with tails. He said, please sir, here is the menu. Please let me know what you want. And the, the professor said, thank you. And then the professor read the menu, read the menu from top to the bottom. And then the professor ate the menu and then paid his bill and left without taking any food. Because that's the trouble with professors. They don't know the difference between the words and what they're describing. So he ate the menu instead of ordering the food. So next time you go to McDonald's, get the menu, eat that instead of ordering a burger, okay? <laughs> so that's one of the reasons why I asked if there's any professors in here, so, <laughs> so I don't get into trouble. But anyway, going back to, where was I? There was, sorry? Oh yeah, about Aristotle. Aristotle. Aristotle, thank you. I've got to get you to do some work here, otherwise you feel useless. Yeah, <laughs> feel useless. Oh, no. <laughs> no, okay. But anyway, <laughs> so Aristotle, he would always teach what they called the six senses. There's the ordinary five senses, seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, physical touch. And the last of those senses was the mind. Read it for yourself. When we, in the West especially, we say we got all our philosophy <coughs> from Greece. That's not true. We lost much of it over the last 2,000 years. That sixth sense of the mind, which Aristotle called the common sense, because whatever you see, hear, smell, taste, touch, your mind can know. It knows the object of the other five senses as well as its own. Over 2,000 years, we've lost our mind and abandoned our common sense. And that's my summary of Western culture. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, there's some truth there. When we get that mind back, into our idea of what our sense life actually is. It makes a huge difference to how we live our life. And this is not just philosophy. That mind is important in so many different ways. Many of you will know that before I was a monk, I was a theoretical physicist at Cambridge University. One of my best friends, and he still is a best friend, uh, was this Buddhist called Bernard Carr, C-A-R-R. -R. And he was also a theoretical physicist. And he became a close, a very close associate of Professor Stephen Hawking. So much so, that uh, when they did a documentary of Professor Hawkins, I think it was called, was it The Theory of Everything or something? There was a documentary about him. And Bernard Carr was actually featured as one of you know, his co-workers. And so Bernard told me that when that movie was uh, premiered in London, he got to go to that movie, to the premiere, and walk on the red carpet. First time he'd ever done that in his life. He was also a Buddhist, a top theoretical physicist. He's now the Emeritus Professor at one of the, I think Queen Mary or Queen Elizabeth College in London University, where he's been teaching theoretical phys physics all his life. He's also a very strong Buddhist, good friend of mine, and also Really interestingly, he is was a professor, the president of the K, of the London Society of Psychic Research. As students, we would investigate ghosts together. 
if we heard there was a haunting somewhere, we'd go there with all, as much equipment as we can and try and get photographs, UV, infrared, whatever we can to try and get more evidence about ghosts. Why not? Because the reason I was a scientist, I wanted to find out about life. And nothing, you know, like people who said there were spirits and ghosts, still you wanted to find out if that was true or not. That's the whole idea of science, to investigate and challenge. And of course, part of science, I think you all know, I'm not going to give you a science lecture here, but you know, quantum theory and Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, it was him. You know his uncertainty principle, but now we know that in order for us to know reality, they call it like collapsing the Schrodinger equation. You do need a mind. There's no alternative for that. A mind is essential for reality as we know it. What collapses the Schrodinger equation. And that was such a very strong, hard evidence of the existence of a mind. And to this day, and I can't see why people don't admit that there is a thing called the mind, which is much stronger than the brain and can influence the body as well. This is, I'm going off subject a little bit, but it's a good introduction. This one of the other things we were part of, well, I already mentioned this, we were part of the Cambridge Society for Psychic Research. And one of the things, one of the experiments we did there, we'd always have a hypnotist come and hypnotize somebody and see what could be done when a person was under hypnosis. And one of the experiments really shocked me. The, one of the students was very happy to be hypnotized and was hypnotized quite deeply. And then the person doing the hypnosis took out a length of wood with a four inch nail through the end of the wood and convinced, he convinced the student that that nail had been heated in a fire and was red hot. They hypnotized the student to believe that. And the hypnotist touched the arm of this man, the student, with that nail. Because he was hypnotized to believe it was a red hot, he screamed out aloud in pain. Ah! That I could understand. What I could never understand was how, in the place where the nail had touched his body, a blister came up. As if it was a real burn. And that was quite shocking. That nail was a room temperature. It could not cause a blister or a burn. Not according to the science I knew. But there was a burn mark, a blister, on the student's hand. Why do I say that story? It's because if your mind is powerful enough because it believes this nail is red hot, it's powerful enough to create a blister. Why can't it be powerful enough to reduce a tumour in people with cancer? Why not? And of course, that has been done. Amazing sometimes when we do our meditation, as long as we do it in the correct way, not making war with anything, but making peace with your body, or peace with any illnesses, peace with your respiratory system if you've got COVID, making peace, not war. And if you can do that, there's so many personal examples in my own life of what this can do. And it's, it's mind-boggling. This I'm going to give two stories now. One I think, they're both real, it's inspiring, the other one is a little bit funny. But the first person, he was this gentleman who came on one of my meditation retreats 
in Sydney, Australia. And the first day of this retreat, this gentleman was breathing so loudly <laughs> that I got all these comments from the other meditators. Can you please ask everybody to breathe quietly? And so I told everybody, that gentleman, he has got a cancer, this big tumour in his sinuses. He cannot breathe through his nose. He told me that his doctors had given up on him. There was no prospect of any cure, no more sort of radiation, chemotherapy or any surgery. And so he decided to try a meditation retreat. This was quite a few years ago. Who knows, it might work. He told me he wasn't even a Buddhist. But nevertheless, meditation, give it a try. And so for nine days, he meditated with me. And after, the, after nine days, he hadn't got anywhere. Still, he couldn't breathe through his nose. For the last meditation, when I'd already packed up, I was getting into the car to go back to Sydney Airport to get a flight back to Perth. He came running after me. He said, Ajahn Brahm, please don't go now. You know, this is, always happens in meditation. It's always the last day, the last meditation that something happens. The reason I say that is because when we try to make something happen, it never does. When we make peace, have a ceasefire with our cancer, we let go, then all the results of those meditation has a chance to work. He came running towards me and said, Ajahn Brahm, the final meditation, I wasn't expecting anything, nothing had worked. The final meditation, as I was sitting down being peaceful, I heard a popping sound in my nose. Pop. He could breathe through his nose again. But just for one minute, and then the tumour closed up again. And just one minute was a wonderful thing. He wasn't imagining this, it was, it was real. And I just told him that my old saying, which I've told you many times, very good, carry on. That is for those who are Buddhists, that's the Buddhist's last words of advice. Usually the part is apamadena sampadeta. Some people say strive on with diligence. My translation is very good, carry on. <laughs> but anyhow, he had a popping sound, he was free from that tumour for a minute, and then it closed up again. I had to get to the airport. He just carried on. And six months later, this guy came to see me in Sydney. He didn't look anything like the person who was dying from sinus cancer. Because when you have a cancer, you've probably unfortunately visited many of your relations and friends. Just you know, all their, their muscles have gone, just they look really thin, just skin and bone, and they look just they look like they're dying. But this guy looked really healthy. And he came up to me and said a question which please never ask me. He said, Do you remember me? <laughs> like, I do travel around a lot. And sometimes I give talks to 5,000 people. And they said, oh yeah, I saw you in one of those talks. <laughs> Do you remember me? <laughs> of course not. So I'm honest. So I said, I don't remember you at all. Who are you? And he said, I was that guy. He said, I went to your meditation retreat. I just had a popping sound on the last day of the retreat, but I carried on. And the tumor had shrunk and shrunk and shrunk. It's no longer there. I'm in full remission. And it's such a wonderful thing to see that a simple bit of meditation, strengthening your mind and allowing your mind to treat the body and the illness as it should with kindness and peace, that works. And he said he's spending the rest of his life, however long he has, teaching that meditation for others. 
a wonderful story which really inspired me. The other story was of this gentleman and he was from Lancashire, from, was it Chester the Street in Manchester? <coughs> Anyone from there? Okay. You are? Yeah, yeah, yeah you are from Manchester, are you? Yeah. A bit further on north, close to the borders. But anyway, that, now he was a very old Lancashire man and of course he smoked for most of his life, smoked cigarettes. So eventually the cancer took over and you know, he was dying of cancer, lung cancer. I remember visiting him in hospital and you know, he was really sick and eventually they put him in the hospice. That was the place you go to to die, the one-way ticket. You go in in an ambulance, you come out in the box. And the first day he was in the hospice, the nurse told him, what do you want for dinner tonight, Ted? And he said it was not just the cancer he had, he had diabetes, <coughs> no, he had high cholesterol, he had too much salt and the big heart and arteries, he had all these diseases. He said, well, I can't eat anything sweet, I can't eat anything oily, I can't eat anything salty. And when he was telling all the things he can't eat, you know, because of his many diseases, that's when the nurse said to him, I said, Ted, you're not going to die of diabetes or a heart attack. You're going to die of cancer in about four or five days. You can eat whatever you want. Imagine that. You're not going to die of these things because cancer is going to get you in five or six days. So he said you can eat whatever you want. So his eyes went wide. He said, really? You mean I can eat the sweetest, the uh, oiliest, saltiest, whatever food I like? Yeah, of course, why not? So in these days we call it, he really pigged out. He had all his favorite meals, which his wife would never let him eat. It's bad for your health. My health is gone now, who cares? So he enjoyed his food so much for five or six days. And this is no exaggeration. I know this story personally. After five or six days, he went into full remission and walked out of the hospital in his own two legs. And eventually he went back after six months. Six months the cancer came back. That joy and happiness was so strong. Hey, come in. Please. Yeah, come in here. Yeah, come in. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Hi. 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 Think we're. Okay. Like a nice and Polish crew, whatever. See this. Okay. We found the place. Well done. But anyway, this guy was. Um, uh, he eventually went back to the hospice to die properly, and I was there with him as he was dying. And if you've ever been with a relation or a loved one who's actually just about to die, it, it takes forever. The doctor said it could be any time. You know, in the morning, the hours went past a few times, and he almost making his last breath. We thought, this is it. Then you breathe in again. So I think you can recognize what I'm talking about. And so we're there for such a long time, and it came close to the 12 noon when monks and nuns have to finish eating. So the, his daughter was there, she said, I'm going to get you some food now. So she quickly went out, the only food she could get was some like fast food, I forget what it was. And then when she came in, she gave some food to me to start eating. And then as they do here in the UK, it's a tradition I remember, she asked her dad, who was in a coma, dying, unconscious for the last few hours, Dad, do you want a chip? And that's when the dad, Ted, opened his eyes and said yes. And that was his last words, I want to eat a chip. <laughs> he died after that, he didn't have a chip, he'd already dead before he could give it to him. But anyway, that was a fascinating story.
And so if you have a loved one and you want to actually to talk to them before they pass away, depending on what nationality they are, this ask this, you know, if it, I don't know, if they're Polish, do you want a sausage? Well, I don't know. Anyway, whatever your favourite food is, but anyway, that was, you know, that happiness and actually what really excites people can reach past the sickness into their mind. This is what happens. The mind is a very fascinating and amazing thing. And the fact that we, many people think it doesn't even exist, that is a big problem. But we know it does exist, and because it exists, we have to know how to deal with it. So having a ceasefire with our mind is actually allowing the mind to be kind. To be kind to your body, be kind to your past and future, and all the people who you encounter in your life. Because sometimes we can see physical tension in our body, but can you know the tension which we have in our mind? There was this philosopher, not philosopher, so he was a psychologist. And this guy came up to him, you know, on a consultation, and he said, I've got a big problem. What is it, said the psychologist? Sometimes, you know, I think, you know, I perceive that I'm a marquee. You know what a marquee is? You know, sometimes you have, in the summertime, you have a party in the garden, and they have a marquee, and you put all the food in there. Even sometimes some wedding ceremonies, they have many marquees, and they go in there for their guests and for the actual ceremony. Sometimes I think I'm a marquee. And other times, I think I'm a wigwam. You know what a wigwam is? That's what indigenous uh, Indians in the United States used to live in wigwams. You know, they know cloth on some, some pieces of uh, wood, and that's where they used to live. Sometimes I think I'm a wigwam, sometimes I think I'm a, a marquee. And the doctor said, I know your problem, it's very common. You're too tense. Don't <laughs> <laughs> come on, you can grow. A marquee is a type of tent. A wigwam is a type of tent. It's a very common problem these days. People are too tense. Why are you too tense? Because we fight our mind and we fight our body. A lot of times if you are sick, why don't you just rest? That's one of the best ways of overcoming sickness. Rest. I'm being personal now, that a lot of times, Ratty, over the last 31 years, I haven't been sick. I never visited doctors or gone to hospitals, except to visit other people who are sick. And it's weird. Other monks in the monastery get sick. I don't tend to. How come? It's because when I do have the time, I ask my body, body, what do you need? Mind, what do you need? It's a way of mindfulness and kindness of asking you know, your body and your mind what it requires. And sometimes I've got up in the morning having had a good night's sleep and then I ask my mind, what do you need? And sometimes, not always, it said, I want more sleep. And instead of arguing with it, saying, you don't need more sleep, you've already had enough sleep. Instead, I'm kind to my mind. I'm aware of what it wants, and the kindness, if it's at all possible, I will give the mind what it requested. And a lot of times, having got up in the morning, if I can squeeze it in, I go to my, I see it's a cave, now I can see what I'm doing. In that cave, I can lay down and have an extra hour's sleep any time of the day or night. That's what my mind wants, that's what I'll give it. And I know that I'm not indulging because as soon as my head hits the pillow, you're gone. You're out. And it wakes up about an hour later or 45 minutes later, 
and it always wakes up with lots of energy, feeling like a million dollars. I was going to say a million pounds, but I think now dollars are worth more than pounds. No, I guess I don't know. But anyway, that is instead of like fighting, you know, what you, your mind and body are telling you, you make peace with it and listen to it. A lot of times your body is more wise than you think. Don't train it. Learn from it. Your mind, your mental state, don't fight it, but learn from it. And one of those ways of learning, I think I even told this last night, so if you were there last night, I apologize. But this was people with mental illnesses. And with many people with mental illnesses, sometimes they're always trying to cure those mental illnesses. They're making a war with them. And instead of making a war with your mind, trying to cure it and get rid of those idiosyncrasies of the mind, it's much better to learn from those. And when you learn from them, you get these amazing uh, new ways of looking at different, what the world said, is mental disabilities. And this was, I was mentioning a talk which I gave at like Mental Health Week uh, over in Australia. They invited me to give a lecture to people who were the, they call them clients of the mental health system. Not the doctors, not the psychologists or psychiatrists or the nurses, but the people those doctors and nurses were trying to cure and look after. When I gave the my lecture, I had many people crying, some laughing. They, they were actually laughing at the jokes and they were crying at what they heard, which made so much sense to them, which they hadn't heard before. And that was where I introduced a wonderful simile of the trees in the forest. I am a forest monk and I live most of my life in forest monasteries in many parts of the world. And I've never yet seen a perfect tree. Imagine what a perfect tree should look like. Always dead straight, no damage on the bark, all the branches in the correct places, all the twigs coming out of those branches in the nice places, all the leaves nice and green with none being chewed by bugs. I've never seen in my life a tree like that. All I've ever seen are trees which are bent and twisted by the wind or other trees falling on them. Seen them with branches taken off by the wind. And it's important because in those holes you know, made by those falling branches, that's where the animals make their nests. Over in my monastery, there's lots of possums. And actually, they're beautiful little animals, like little cats. And their babies usually go on their back. And because no one has ever really harmed or hurt them, those little possums come out at night. And they're totally, um, they're wild, but you can touch them. Even stroke the little babies on the back. They don't mind at all. They've got no fear of human beings or monks. It's so gorgeous you know, to be with animals and be able to be at peace with them. And so these are the damage done to the trees give habitat for many animals in the Australian forest. And over here in the UK, just you know, in that garden over in Stroud, you know, this afternoon, I was looking at the little squirrels coming out and they were just so tame they're just standing around in the garden just looking at you and they were just very peaceful it's nice to see i love looking at wild animals because it's, you enjoy it maybe because i don't have a tv i don't watch nature channel or something it's very delightful but anyway i've never seen a perfect tree all I've ever seen is trees which are bent and twisted and damaged. And so I told the clients 
of the mental health system. If you are bent and twisted, if you regard yourself as damaged goods, please know that you belong in the forest of humanity, just like all those other bent and twisted trees which you see outside. You belong. You're not excluded. We're all bent and twisted, each in our own way. And because I've been visiting Aya Chanda for how many weeks now? Almost two weeks. Two weeks. She knows how bent and twisted I am. <laughs> <laughs> all the silly jokes and stuff. But I've never seen any human being who's not bent and twisted and damaged somewhere in their life. So number one, you belong. And that's one of the great difficulties with people with um, some sort of difference. I will not call it disability anymore. Their abilities are there, but they're different abilities that other people know about. So first of all, you belong. And secondly, those who are the most twisted and damaged. You are some of the trees which I like the best. They're the beautiful ones. If ever you want to have a photograph taken in a forest, which tree would you associate with and want your photograph to be you know, shrouded by? The, the damaged trees, the twisted ones. They've got the most character, more beautiful. So when I say to you, not only just welcome, you're some of the most amazing trees in the forest. That just turned the whole idea of disability around. They weren't disabled, they really were special and gorgeous and beautiful. And unfortunately, our society sometimes doesn't recognize those abilities. It's getting better at it. But when we do, we find we don't make a war with our mind. We embrace it, include it, and then we find its value. So you can imagine if you've ever had any mental illnesses, just how freeing that feels. And I'm not just talking about this in theory, this is real. And we know, you know, in the stories of many, many people, uh, the story I'm going to tell you now is about a monk, a Buddhist monk over in Thailand, and he was fully enlightened, but the story of how he became enlightened was really weird and encouraging for each one of us. Because when he was born, when he went to school as about a five-year-old, in the villages in the northeast of Thailand, he only went to school for four years, grade one, two, three, four, and that's all they had for kids. If you were really good, maybe you could go into the town and do some more education, and maybe even go to university later on. And the four years was the standard education for everybody. And this young man, he wasn't a monk yet, just an ordinary kid, he failed grade one. I can't see how that is possible. Maybe his plasticine skills were no good or the drawing, the stick drawings which people made were hopeless. How on earth can you fail grade one? But he did. So that everyone else in the class had to go on to grade two, and he had to repeat grade one, the second year. And after the second year in grade one, the teacher, with all the kindness she had, said, look, I cannot pass it into grade two. So he had to repeat grade one for a third year. And after finishing grade one for a third year, the teacher said his learning difficulties were still too strong. I cannot pass him. So after failing grade one three years in a row, there was no other choice for him. He had to leave school. And his parents realized that someone who kept on failing grade one three years in a row was not even smart enough to take the water buffalo out into the fields to graze. 
So there's only one, one other possibility for him. Take him to the monastery and ordain him as a novice monk. No novice monk started like that. No novice nuns. Did they? <laughs> but anyhow, they had a very kind monk in the village monastery. He really looked after this young monk, tried to teach him the chanting. And just as an example, now one of the things which we chant in Theravada, Namo Tassa, it took him about three months to learn Namo. And then once he learned Namo, now let's get on to Tassa. He managed after a month to get Tassa, but in the meantime he forgot Namo. <laughs> so it was a really difficult case. And after a couple of years in the monastery, even the abbot just lost his patience. He said, no, it's useless. You can't stay here. So there's one last possibility for him. And that was the forest monasteries. You know, the Wat Bar. And that's where I come from. <laughs> when I went to Cambridge, I was really stupid. This guy was smart. So when he went to a forest monastery, they don't learn chanting there. They do learn some chanting, but mostly they learn meditation. So they gave this guy who failed grade one, three years in a row, a simple method of meditation. And this man's mind was so pure, so empty, he hardly thought. So when he started meditating, it was the simplest thing in the world for him. He went into his wonderful meditations, really easily, very deeply, and soon all the other monks knew he was another fully enlightened Arahat being in the world. And then he managed eventually to become a monk, and because this was still a novice monk, and when he became a monk, he could actually join in the chanting. And how he would do that, being such a great meditator, he'd access his mind. His mind could remember previous lives. Whether you think about it or not, this is actually true. Sometimes people ask me uh, earlier, Ajahn Brahm, do you believe in rebirth? And I said, no, I don't. I know it as truth. So anyway, that's that certainty there. But anyhow, for this guy, he could access a previous life when he was a monk before, and he could learn the chanting then. And then he could <coughs> get the chanting of a previous life, put it in this life, and that's how he could chant perfectly. It's weird, but that's how he survived. This is one of the reasons why, when you understand what the mind can do, it's really, very really powerful healing and also understanding just how to learn and understanding that sometimes the power of the mind can be so strong when you don't think so much you can be peaceful you can know much more this is one of the problems with learning we think that learning means going to school means like understanding what things mean, giving them names, figuring out how those names all work together. We think that is wisdom. And I think you all know from your life, you may know what things are called, you may have a disease and know its name, you may have a psychological problem and know the theory behind it, but does that actually work? Sometimes when we know the mind, we get these great insights and understanding of how your mind works. But you don't do that by fighting a war with the mind. To be able to get very still, especially in your meditation, this is one thing which I'm really surprised not more monks and nuns actually teach. If you force the mind, it's like making a war with it. If you have a ceasefire with the mind, you actually understand it. You learn from it. 
when you learn from it, it is the wisdom and the kindness which gives you the power to find solutions to all the problems which, which worry or bother you. It's the wisdom which comes from things like peace and silence, not the wisdom which comes from reading books. I put my hand up here because I've read many, many books. And I still remember one of the first uh, experiences I had with a, a Zen monk. He came to UK. This was I don't know, over 50 years ago. And I went to the temple in, uh, in Richmond at the time. It was a Thai temple. And <coughs> this monk, he just gave a talk there. It was a hopeless talk because he didn't know a word of English. It was all translated. But then he went on a tour around England, probably to Bristol as well, I'm not sure. But when he came back to the Thai temple in London, this Zen monk, he could speak a few words of English. So we asked him, I was in the audience there, when someone asked him, what do you think of Buddhism in UK? And his answer was so eloquent, in such a few words, but its meaning was so powerful that everybody appreciated it. What he said was Buddhism in England. Books, books, books. Too many, too many, too many. Dustbin, dustbin, dustbin. <laughs> Just like you, I laughed when I heard that. We have the intellectual Buddhism. Does that work? or the feeling, experiential Buddhism, that is far more powerful. That is where we know the mind, understand it, and make peace with it. Even just yesterday, over in Stroud, someone asked me a wonderful question about, they were meditators, how do we deal with the restless mind? You know what that is. You're meditating and the mind won't stay still, it'll go all over the place. For years, this is my personal training, I've been meditating over maybe 53 years now. And my mind was very restless. And I was, had a lot of determination. So when my mind wandered off somewhere, I'd bring it back. I was gentle with it, I didn't punish it, so I thought. And I'd go off somewhere else and I'd have to bring it back again. I thought this was training my mind. Every time it wandered off, I'd bring it back. And I did that for years. And then it wasn't working. Does that work for you? Being honest. And then so, instead of actually doing what I was told by others, I decided to investigate. Why does my mind wander off? At that time, I didn't have much responsibilities. I didn't have to do things. But even so, my mind would want to do things. Why? And then I realized that the reason why my mind and I did not want to stay together was because I had a bad relationship to my mind. I was trying to tell you what to do to train it. I was not treating my mind like a friend. Remember later on coming over here to UK and visiting an old friend. We were at college together and he was now the, the head auditor in the whole of Europe. He was a very wonderful man, but I didn't know some of the silly things he did, which as a student, his name was Harold. I remember one party we had in the college he got so drunk, he went to the toilet and he forgot to put his pants on when he came out of the, the toilet. And we all saw that. His name was Harry, so he got the nickname Flash. <laughs> Flash Harry. <laughs> and anyway, those nicknames stick. But now he was like the head auditor of the whole of Europe. When I said, how are you doing Flash? He said, Please, don't say that. <laughs> but he was a really good friend. So anyway, 
and we're supposed to just have a, a quick chat. But because you meet an old friend for the first time in years, you just you just can't stop the chatting. I remember being in a Sri Lankan restaurant just outside of Victoria in London, and we started talking together. And even though in a restaurant, you know, they were feeding me my lunch, we're supposed to give a blessing. And now we didn't have time to give the blessing. I was just talking to my friend for an hour. Well, maybe two. We still hadn't finished. I was giving a talk in the Thai temple. Now in, uh, yeah, it was in Wimbledon. So we went together there on the, the underground to Wimbledon, talking all the time in the train. <coughs> and when we got out of the train station, walked to the temple, we were still talking. Don't know I talk that much to you? No. Not like that for hours. There's an old friend I haven't seen for years. We were you know, so close together, there's no way you could actually, that he could wander off. And I remember that story. It showed that when you really care for someone, and you're really like in harmony together, you don't want to be anywhere else. And from that I realised, the wandering mind, it all comes because you've got a bad relationship to your mind. You're trying to train it. You're trying to criticize it. When you have this beautiful relationship to your mind, right now I'm quite busy. When I have a few moments and I can just watch my mind, it's like my mind says, Hey, you're back again. Yeah, I'm here. We've got about an hour. Shall we hang out together? Yeah. <coughs> and so my mind doesn't go anywhere. It stays with me because we're the best of friends. <coughs> That's what I mean by a ceasefire. When you make friends with the thing you're trying to train, like you make friends with your cough, make friends and just cough whatever you wish to do. Thank you. And thank you for doing that because it adds to my simile. So if I said, cough what you need, a nice little bit of water, so please drink. That kindness heals your cough and that kindness keeps you on your meditation object and that kindness to your mind just makes your mind much more easier to deal with. The other simile, I keep on saying this simile but it's one of the best ones. This is my last talk over here in UK before I go to Norway tomorrow. So. That story about how heavy is this glass of water? Now apparently the, one of the people here who've been staying with them last night and tonight as well, they were actually at the uh, Imperial College London when I gave this simile about 13 years ago. And at that talk, the Imperial College London is one of the top sort of science colleges and technology colleges. They took one look at this and they said, I reckon about 120 grams. <laughs> that really, really deflated us. <coughs> not what my talk is all about. How heavy is this glass of water? The longer you hold it, the heavier it feels. <coughs> if I hold this for one minute, I'm in pain. In two minutes, I'll be in extreme pain. Three minutes, a very stupid monk, you'll have to take me probably to the hospital. What should I do when it starts to get too heavy to hold comfortably? Put it down. Put it down for maybe 30 seconds. And try it at home if you like. You pick it up afterwards, it feels lighter and easier to hold. What does that mean? That means any of you who get stressed out, you've got a job to do, an article to write, an email to finish, and instead of making a ceasefire with your mind, you make a war with it. I've got to finish this, there's a deadline, we have to do this. That kind of attitude, what that does, you get burnout. You get so tired, you have to put so much energy 
to work when you're tired, much more so than when you're relaxed. So when it gets too heavy to hold, put it down. But I can't do that, I've got too much work to do. Put it down. Because what happens, instead of making a, a wall with your mind, you make a ceasefire with it and rest. Then after about half an hour, maybe an hour, depends on how tired you are, you pick it up again, it's easier to hold. Your brain has rested, re-energized, and you find you get more ideas and more clarity. I practice what I teach. Sometimes I need to write an article, sometimes you have to write an email answer or make some decision. So sometimes I look at my mind, it's too tired to make a decision. And I know if I force it, I waste time. So instead, even though it's really important, it has to be done, I just rest and do nothing. Meditate. And it works well all the time. You go back to your computer, you go back to your task, and when you go back after you've really rested, ideas come up. I don't know how it works, but sometimes you can't think of the right word. And when you are rested, you can write your email, you write your article, and it comes out really well. If you want to see an example of that, one of those books which I wrote, The Art of Disappearing. Have you read that one? I'm disappearing. Have a look at the, the forward there. Wisdom Publications in the United States said we need a forward. And I just had a nice meditation. So that forward there I wrote in about five minutes. It's one of my best pieces of work, I reckon, because it's full of lots and lots of silly jokes. And at the end, it said, may you all get lost. <laughs> you remember that one? But anyway, after writing it, I emailed it off to Wisdom Publications in the United States. And I said, look, I'm sorry, but I just wrote this so quickly. It sounded really good, but if you don't like it, I'll write another one sort of tomorrow. And they emailed back, no, this is lovely. Thank you so much. Sometimes, when you can meditate and be still and peaceful, you get so much innovation coming up. And whatever you write or whatever you do, it's usually very beautiful and very wonderful. Even that one of those Buddhist magazines in the United States, it was Inquiry Mind, I think it was, they were asking all these uh, well-known Buddhist monks and nuns and lay teachers, to write an article about what enlightenment means to them. So they asked me to write something about enlightenment. And so I wrote my article. I haven't ever seen this show on TV because I don't have a TV, I don't watch TV. But it was a TV show called Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? That's, is that, that's the TV show, is it still on? Yeah. Okay, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? So my article was entitled who Wants to Be Enlightened? I had four contestants on this TV show, Who Wants to Be Enlightened? I had so much fun writing it. The prize, was a solid, the prize was a solid gold meditation cushion. Hell to sit on, but lovely to look at. And had all these contestants vying to actually to, to, um, to win this prize. Have a look at it. I think that's in... I think I opened the door of your heart. I, I rewrote it somewhere. But that took, five, again, about 10 minutes to write. And then when I sort of finished writing it, I emailed it, and they said, I said to them, you probably won't like this. I said, no, this is great. This is original, funny. It also has some very meaningful tips in there about enlightenment. So that's the bill has been my life. If you think that I've achieved a lot as a Buddhist monk, if you think I wrote some good books, told some good anecdotes, helped you, whichever which way, it's always because I know how to relax to the max, so you don't get burnt out. So you can actually just regenerate your energies. And that's one of the reasons why 
coming to teach poor Ayachanda here who has been working so hard. He does get burnt out. This is one way I can help. That's what often I hope each one of you can help in your own way later on. So anyway, I have been talking for an hour. Yeah. So usually my talks last one hour. I hope you enjoyed it. But I often tell another story about mindfulness, I think, which I said yesterday. To make, you know, I'm sure you know the context. And it was, uh, it was a poem by William Blake, which said, to see a world in a grain of sand. To have so much mindfulness and kindness, even in a grain of sand, you can see so much in there which other people miss. See a heaven in a wild flower. So beautiful, more beautiful than you can ever expect. Hold infinity in the palm of your hand. And the fourth standards, stanza was, see eternity in an hour. And my talk lasted one hour. <laughs> I hope you could see eternity in it. Thank you. Okay. You can clap if you want to. So now we can have some questions, comments or complaints, the three C's. If the sound wasn't any good, where's the sound engineer? It was good? Okay. Was the quality of the talk okay? Were the chairs okay? Any complaints, go and see the management outside of the, the desk. Was the temperature okay? Were the lights okay? So there should be no questions. No? Okay. So thank you for coming. We'll see you next year. No? No, okay. Let's get some questions then. Who's going to ask the first question? Yes, thank you. First of all, thank you for your wonderful teaching. It's really quite changing. For the better or for the worse? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> if one experiences not fear in meditation, ah, okay, great. what can one do? First of all, don't make war with it. This is one of the other things about uh, having a ceasefire with the mind. Instead, you experience and fear. The reason is investigate it. Why was my mind wandering? Instead of trying to train my mind to sit still, instead of saying, why does it want to move? Where does that fear come from? Where the fear comes from, number one, is because in meditation, you do start to experience some really powerful states. And anything powerful, even if it's kind, and gentle, and very beneficial, is still very scary. So it's because of its power, and you don't know how to deal with something so amazingly powerful, much bigger than you, you get a bit afraid of it, even though it's kind of beneficial. So first of all, that's one reason why we get scared. And if that's the case, just invite it in a little bit more each time. Because you can always stop it any time. That's what you've been doing so far. You're afraid when you come out of the meditation or something. Next time, go a little bit further in. A little bit, you know you can come out, just to test it out. The simile is that, I'm not quite sure if you can remember, when you were growing up, as a little kid, you knew how to walk, and then your mummy or something took you to the swimming pool, so you could learn how to swim. And imagine what that must be like to a young kid. They just learned how to walk, and now they have to face this water stuff. And so you, they're afraid, some kids. So you put one foot in the water, then you take it out again. That was okay. The mummy puts two feet in the water for the kid. That's okay. Then holding on to the kid very gently, but safely, you put two legs in the water. Okay, that's okay. Then you put half the body in the water, take it out, that's okay. 
And the kid grows in this confidence. As you grow in the confidence with these powerful meditation states, you don't push yourself too far and too fast. You do it gently, with kindness. And then you let your kid into the swimming pool. And then mummy can't get the kid out of the swimming pool anymore, they're having too much fun. <laughs> and that's like the deep meditations. Once you get in, you think, what was I afraid of? This is amazing. And the other thing which people are afraid of is a lot of times we're afraid of losing things we're attached to. Now, that's one of the reasons why that, you know, if you have some tension in your chest, ah, this must be a heart attack. Ah, it's not, it's just been got a bit of indigestion or something. But it's the fear of losing what we're attached to, in this case, our life. That really exaggerates the experiences. When you've got nothing to lose, you find there's no fear. My uh, preceptor in Thailand, he was a, uh, a monk in Bangkok. And he became the acting Sangharaja of Thailand for a while. And I always thought he was a great scholar. I never realized that all those monks in Thailand had to learn some meditation. And he told me that his teacher had taught him how to meditate and he was in a coconut plantation. This was in Got Samoy, before it became a famous tourist resort, it was just an ordinary island in the south of Thailand. And he was in Got Samoy and he was meditating there under the coconut tree. And when he came out of meditation, it was a very peaceful meditation, and he saw on his lap was curled up a snake. And he knew that snake, his parents and teachers had warned him that's a very, very dangerous snake. If he bit him, he would be dead. And so he saw that on his lap. He said the most amazing thing was, after a good meditation, there was absolutely no fear at all. He was so at peace with that snake. He didn't try and uh, push it away and run away. He just was very happy having a warm lap that snake was resting. And then after about 10 minutes, that snake just uncurled itself and slid harmlessly away. And he said that was so amazing. After meditation, after doing a lot of letting go, he wasn't afraid of death. The fear of death came back to him later on. But for that time, you realize what fear is and how it's overcome. Deep peace. And of course, the other fear, a lot of time people are afraid of being free. If you've been in jail for 20, 30 years, and next week you are going to be released into the world, that's one of the most scariest of things. And the way we do it these days is you get like a weekend release. Then you go back to jail afterwards. They very slowly accustom you to life in the world outside instead of being in an institution. Same with that's what meditation does. You go on retreats. It's like nine day release. Then you have to go back to your work again afterwards. You work in this world. But then after a while you get quite used to actually not afraid of being in deep meditation where you don't have access to your mobile phone, where you don't have any problems with making decisions <coughs> in your family or in the world. You don't worry about any money problems. You leave that world just for a few days on a meditation retreat. You might work release from jail, and then you're never afraid of that ever again. Does that make sense? Thank you. Okay, good. Okay, and in the next question? <coughs> Yes. How do you meditate? Very easily. Listen to me. Keep looking at my eyes. You know me very well. Now, as I'm speaking, you'll notice many spaces between my words. In those spaces, what were you thinking? Nothing. You're peaceful. You're meditating. 
we can close our eyes. And some people close their eyes and they're still thinking a lot. When you are your age, it's wonderful to meditate. You don't have to think about anything at all. Be peaceful. That's how we meditate. Is that okay? Okay. So with your mummy and your daddy, do they meditate at home? They better do, because I've known them for so many years. <laughs> <laughs> so when they do, you meditate with them. And then you find you're so much smarter at school. And, and then next time you get 40 out of 40 in your math exam, <laughs> not 39. It does make you smart, meditating. Yes? The audience is very, it was great when we talked about it. I have a question. Um, he says, I have some very painful memories. So when you're saying we should like uh, yeah. a very good relationship with our mom, yeah. <laughs> should I just let it go? Should I let it review and review those pictures again? Oh, by the time I'm doing it, how can I feel better? Okay. This is a good question. The answer will take about five or six or seven minutes. But this was based on a story which I hope you all know, you know, from my own father, when he took me aside as a 12 year old, I think maybe 13, and told me, whatever I do in my life, son, the door of my house will always be open to you. That's what he said. And his house was a small council flat in a poor part of Axel. It was not much of a house to open up to anybody, honestly. Often we wouldn't lock the, the door of the house because we always thought we had nothing to lose, nothing in there almost. We thought that maybe if a burglar came in, the burglar would take pity on us and leave us something. <laughs> we were poor. It's only later on I realised that he didn't mean the house, he meant his heart. And that meant so much to me. That expression, whatever you do in your life, son, the door of my heart will always be open to you. It was unconditional love. And that meant a huge amount. And I also, I told that so many times, even one of my books, you know, the title was Opening the Door of Your Heart. It did become a bestseller. I remember somebody in Adelaide went to the bookshop looking for it. They found it eventually. And honestly, I can't make these things up. It was found in the medical section. <laughs> Heart surgery. <laughs> Some person just looked at the cover of the book. I wasn't talking about Okay, that's medical. But anyhow, <laughs> a local group in Perth, psychologists. And I like that story so much. It is used, it's been used for many years, as a therapy for those who come into Australia as refugees because they've been tortured and traumatised by some of these very violent regimes in our world. Australia and UK are very kind countries. If somebody really has, you know, gone through hell and worse in some of these underground dungeons or whatever in some parts of this world, then you know, they can get refugee status, which means their body is free, and their mind still remembers those horrific experiences which they totally did not deserve. So how can that mind become free? And to my surprise, I never gave authorization for this. I'm glad I didn't need to. There's a group called Australian Society of Survivors of Torture and Trauma. They call themselves assets. And they're using open the door of your heart as one of their very successful 
seller piece. So you have these people who have got very traumatic memories, which won't go away. And they, first of all, you have to feel safe. That's such an important part of healing. You feel safe in these places, if it's a hospital or the therapist, or if you do like hypnotic regression or anything. The key to that is the person you're with, you feel so safe with. You know they just will not harm you. So once that safety is established, you teach one of the survivors of torture and trauma just to meditate a little bit, just get a nice posture, get a little bit of peace, not much because they keep thinking about these terrible things in the past. And sit down quietly and just close your eyes and imagine in your chest a double door. And open that door, wide open, and inside is that part of you which you're at peace with. The part of you which had some happy, good memories. And that's inside your heart. And when you look outside on the hard concrete floor, in the rain, in the cold, for all those little girls, you remember that was you in the past. They've been so badly treated. They've been so you know, beaten and raped and abused in so many ways. And they're outside your heart. You recognize them. They're too painful sometimes to see. You imagine a, a ladder, a staircase coming down from your heart to the floor. And you inside the one you are happy with and at peace with. Invite all those little youths who are so badly treated, cause so much pain and injury. Invite them all to come up. Come inside. You're who I am. I'll no longer reject you and keep you outside. One by one they come up those stairs. And sometimes it's just very really tough to be able to do. And eventually you know you have to one day. And then when they all come up, you know, a big hug. I will never keep you out of my heart ever again. It doesn't mean that you are agreeing or condoning the people who did that to you. And this is who you are. You give this beautiful loving kindness that all my heart's open to you. Come in. And when you embrace that past totally fully, it changes you. And when you do, you're no longer a traumatized person anymore. You're a person that has experienced trauma. You've learned from it, accepted it, embraced it. And I'm not to say this, I've had a pretty easy life compared to some of these people. But talking with these people, seeing them, I said I think in the talk earlier, they're like my heroes. There's one particular girl, she was telling someone what she went through in some third world country somewhere, in the Middle East I think it was. She was so badly treated and tortured and, and abused. And then a young man she was telling it to, you know, she had no um, resistance in telling other people what she'd experienced, truthfully. And the boy she was telling it to said, oh, that's terrible what happened to you. And then she said, you've no right to say that. This is who I am. And I will never think that I'm being demeaned or diminished in any way ever again. This is who I am. And the strength of that woman was really immense. She'd been through hell, but you know, she survived and was a much more powerful, courageous, compassionate, wise woman because of it. So I don't know what you've been through, whatever it was, when you feel safe and courageous, just imagine the part of you in your history, inside your heart, which you can live with so easily. And then in the meditation, imagine 
all those people that were here were so badly hurt. Invite them in. Don't try to get rid of them. Trying to get rid of them is the problem. And when they come in, oh, you cry a lot, it's worth it. Welcome the emotion in and also welcome those people in as well. Yeah, so we're working with the emotions and it receives fire. And those people too, let's see you are. There's a little girl in the past, I don't know what happened. But she was trying her very best. It's rotten she was treated that way. But that's you. Come in. And you become a better person as a result, not a worse person. Mm. Thank you very much. Okay. Yes. Thank you for the wonderful speech, uh, the enlightening speech. Uh, my question is slightly similar to the previous one. Yes. As you know, I'm, I'm grieving for the loss of my daughter. Yes. Yeah. And I'm used to thinking fighting grief. Uh, but I want, how do you make peace? How do you have ceasefire grief? Yes. Good God. question. No, no, first of all, um, of course that happened, and when it does happen, what do you think about? Why is it so hard to bear? You don't fight this or try to diminish it, you understand it. You remember, Krishna, you were a Buddhist for such a long time, do you remember those many stories about this being called Mara, trying to stop the Buddha becoming enlightened, getting involved in all sorts of shenanigans to stop great monks and nuns becoming enlightened. And how did those monks and nuns and lay people deal with Mara? They didn't sort of kick him or push him away. All they said was, I know you, Mara. When Mara realized that the monks or nuns knew him. He turned away, shoulders hunched, heads down. The monk knows me, the nun knows me. That's how Mara was vanquished <coughs> by wisdom, never by force. So, what is grief? And grief is just noticing what you've lost and not seeing what you had. I think I mentioned that to you, that earlier, you had nine years with that daughter. Thank you, that was so valuable, that was so precious. You can never sort of be sad when you realise what you've had. And you all know that I've said this story so many times, my own father died when I was 16. And I loved my father, he told me open the door of your heart. One of the other examples was that when I was 11 years of age, I got into the school football team. That was a big thing for an 11 year old. When I got into the school football team, I told my dad, Dad, I've got a place in the school football team, we're playing on Saturday. He said, I'm sorry son, I'm working on Saturday. You might think that that's a small thing, but for me that was just, oh, I've got a place in the team and my father can't come and watch me. So I went there to some on my own, you know, just put on the football kit, start the early school football team, primary school. And then when I started playing, I heard this someone shouting at me, come on son. And I turned around to my dad. So we, and afterwards, I couldn't say anything during the match, but I said, what are you doing here? You're supposed to be working. He said, yes, I, I am supposed to be working. I told my boss, I have to have a series of injections every Saturday morning <laughs> for the next four or five weeks. <laughs> he lied. And he risked his job because he realised just how important it was that his son could see him at the football match. And I love my father for things like that. Okay, it was bad teachings, teaching me about the importance of lying. But nevertheless, the love there is something which was so much more powerful. So because of that, when he died, I never felt sad. That was so weird. I didn't understand why 
I could have no grief when a father you love so much has passed away. I was 16. And then what happened was when I became a monk, it was like some unfinished business which I'd never worked out. How come I never cried with the sad of my father's death? So one nice thing about being a monk or a nun, especially a young monk, a young nun, you do have some time to investigate. What was that feeling? And I soon recognized it was so similar to the experiences I had here in London, or actually in London, going to these great concerts. I did go to all sorts of concerts, uh, rock concerts and folk concerts. I remember going to this folk, one folk concert in the Albert Hall, and there one of the bands who were playing there. Uh, oh, what they, they did Bridge Over Troubled Water. No, not Bridge Over Troubled Water. Uh, like smoke Over the Water. Yeah, well, not, it wasn't Pink Floyd. Deep Purple. Deep Purple, that's right. It was one of their first concerts. That's so unfair. Yeah. <laughs> and I really embarrass, uh, make her jealous when I say it. I, I did see the very first concert of Les Zeppelin. And that was in the Marquis yeah, Club. That's not fair, no. <laughs> and I also went to another concert once. Uh, and the lead singer, there's only about six people turned up to watch. And the lead singer there was Rod Stewart. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, going to those concerts, you know, once the concert had finished, what did I do? We stood up, shouted, and screamed for more. And the band would often play a little bit longer. Just like your daughter. You know, after getting rid of the, was it leukemia or whatever? And she carried on for an encore. And then, in the end, the band had to leave. I had to go in a different direction. Yeah, I'm mean, sure that bands like Led Zeppelin and Deep Purple, and when they carried on for many years, I don't know if they're still going, but I knew that that sound would never be the same. You never hear those early concerts of those great musicians. So I never felt even though I knew the concert was over, I never cried after a great concert. And I remember going out of those clubs and big halls thinking that what a wonderful concert and how privileged I was, how lucky I was to have been there at the time. That's how I felt. I felt privileged and luck. And so that's why I never cried. That's exactly how I felt my father died. How lucky I was to be his son for 16 years. That was brilliant. That was fab, as you keep reminding me. Do you still use the word fab these days? I thought it was a 60s word, okay. Anyway, it was so wonderful just having that man as my father. And I never regretted that. It would be wonderful it was more than 16 years. But Sixty years was amazing. Nine years, it's not much. But thank you, daughter, so much. For allowing me to be your dad. It takes grief away. It gives you privilege instead. And yes? I have another question um, related to grief, not seeing yes. this. this. My question would be more agreeing about what's happening in the natural world. Mm -hmm. um, I live in the mountains in Spain, I live in a, I work in a natural park, and the changes that I'm seeing over the last few years are, for me, I feel a great grief. Mm -hmm. um, birds that used to come at a certain time of the year are coming in the morning. Um, you know, you can't pick wild asparagus in February. Pine nuts have disappeared, you can't. Find anymore. All of these different changes to happen with climate changes, um, invasive species, all sorts of things um, related to ecology. I have a lot of moments, I'm sure those people do, of just feeling really desperate and really sad about 
all of these things that we're using. Would that be similar? Yes. It's sometimes that if you feel sad and you are depressed and you ever feel there's no hope, and that sometimes that that is like the destruction of a habitat and it's like a virus and you're catching that virus too. Lack of hope doesn't help anybody. And then, I know this is more extreme, but if you ever go down to the south of England, to something they call the New Forest. It's a beautiful forest. You know where that originated from? It was these were the walls with Spain. And to make the boats for the Spanish Armada, they cut all the oak trees down just north of Southampton from Portsmouth. And it was almost like clear fell the forest. And they always planted more trees in those days. And now if you go down to the New Forest, it's a beautiful forest. It takes a lot of time. And instead of crying over what's destroyed, heroes plant more trees. And I like the idea of planting a tree. We have these sayings about trees in Buddhism. That a tree will shade, give shade to the person who's cutting it down. There's nothing about that, it's terrible to cut, to cut it down, but the tree is actually even shading and being kind to them. And so we can always find some, some way of dealing with the problem. And it may not work, but at least we're giving it the best shot we possibly can. And as far as the, the natural world is concerned about, especially the animals, we have lots of bushfires over in Australia. A lot of people are so surprised that many of the, the small little animals, I don't know how they do this, but they come back again and they regenerate and they actually beat the predictions of scientists. I don't know how it works. <coughs> they do come back again. They do recolonize the forest. It's wonderful to see that. So our job is to try and protect the forest, and try and protect the habits, habitats, try not to have too much destruction. At the same time, the sub heroes like you, plant more, don't get so depressed and so much hopeless. We can build a new forest. And it actually works. A new forest in your area of Spain. Every tree cut down and plants me. That's actually doing something. There's an old story in Buddhism, the simile of the quail. There was a big forest fire. This was 2,500 years ago, supposed to be in, in uh, India. A big forest fire, and all the animals escaped. The quails, the small bird was flying off, and they saw there's many animals who can't escape. So the legs were too small, or they've just been born. Or well, there's somehow that there's no way they can crawl that fast. So this little quail of thought, why should I escape when all these other animals are going to be dead from burnt by this fire? So the little quail so sort of went into one of the lakes, wet all his feathers as much as he could, and fly over the fire and just beat his wings really fast. So a few drops of the water could fall into that fire. He did that time and time and time again. Any rational person would think that's impossible. Most of that water would be evaporated by the heat you know, before it even reached the ground. He kept on doing that. And according to the story, the heavenly beings were just really moved by the courage and the hope of this little bird doing an impossible task. Because they saw that, they saw we must help. And so the heavenly beings created this unseasonal cloud and rainstorm to put out that fire. The Buddha's simile of the quail it was hopeless. 
but if he didn't do anything, all those animals would die. This tiny quail saved the whole forest. Another story about that. And if you may not believe in heavenly beings, but nevertheless, there's some small people start doing a task. When other people see that, they help. And even just, and I do believe, I do know that our heavenly beings, something that really gets them really excited. They say, okay, we're going to give this a, a help. We create somehow conditions that other beings, our little animals, can, can come back somehow to their habitat. And more sort of trees and flowers and grasses and stuff can grow. Don't always be so logical. Logic would say it's hopeless. Be emotional. I know that's even more powerful. Oh yeah, how's the time crack? Okay, one, two, over here and then at the back. Here first of all, yes? No, I think um, in the world we live in today, with all the technologies and you know, internet and mobile phones, we're able to access a huge amount of information. And I sometimes find it very convenient because we can watch a wonderful teaching uh -huh. in Australia yeah. while we're in the living room in the UK. Um, but, however, I think we're all curious in our nature. So I often find myself spend more than I should on seeking for answers or, or you know, just just accessing yeah. all this information. And the result of that is I find meditation actually getting harder to this is why I'm sitting there and with all the things I've been reading or you know, the picture or whatever. So I find it very hard harder to concentrate. Yeah. I, I would like to know your opinions about yeah. more than Do you own a mobile phone? Do you own a mobile phone? I do. No, you don't. The mobile phone owns you. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you say it like that? That scares you. The mobile phone, they used to call it cell phone. <laughs> cell means prison. And when you actually look on your mobile phone to see if you've got a signal, you see how many bars you have. <laughs> <laughs> the language should be reminding you. <coughs> and the other thing is that sometimes we feel we have to answer those emails. We have to find out what's happening. First of all, having to answer the emails. If you say that I'm having one day a week, I'm not answering the emails. You find that you can. And other people will respect you for that. Because everyone is in the same situation, owned by our mobile phones, in prison with our cell, in our cell phones with many bars. That's one of the reasons why when I first built our retreat centre in Perth, we made sure that the mobile phone coverage was really bad. <laughs> <laughs> but unfortunately, the telco companies have increased the power of their mobile phone networks. But nevertheless, this is something you can do. Would you like to be peaceful or to be informed? And the information as well, you always know what's going on. Every now and again you don't watch any news broadcast. You know anything this, this is going to happen. The government is not doing their job. There's corruption uh, amongst the ministries. The people are always losing the football matches. The, there's always scandals here. The economy is going terrible. Sometimes I can write the news myself. <laughs> if, <laughs> Why do you want to know that? You think you have to. You don't. Be rebellious. Be informed. Be very happy. Okay, it's enough there. At the back there. Yeah. Hi. Hi. I was wondering if it is possible for a child's life to see spider, and I'm asking because when I try to get a spider, I'm trying to get a spider, and I'm asking because when I try to meditate or listen to the teachings or 
I put some chat in the room, just in the background, my son, who I tried to encourage to join me, wouldn't stand still, let alone sit still, so I was wondering how could I make a very active child. How old is he? Sorry? Four and a half. Four and a half, yeah. I know, I know he's on the so I was wondering if there's anything in the chat of him. It certainly is. It's actually not that hard. Well, you can make it into a game who can sit for longer and just be quiet. <laughs> Sometimes you can do that. But there is this one lady many years ago in Australia. Now she had two kids. And she, they would never allow her to meditate. And every time they say, Mummy, Mummy, I need to go to the toilet. Mummy, 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 I need a glass of water. Mummy, Mummy, Mummy. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> but how she overcome that problem. She's again one of my heroes. She One day she said, no, I'm going to meditate. I don't care what my kids do. So she sat down comfortably and closed her eyes. And the two kids, Mummy, I need to go potty. Mummy, I need to go glass of water. She didn't move. And then they started pulling her hair. Mummy, 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 I really need to go potty. Mummy, 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 I really need a glass of water. She didn't move. Never underestimate the ingenuity of your children. <laughs> mummy, mummy, mummy. Um, cotton has turned on the gas on the stove. <laughs> mummy, mummy, mummy. Sarah has got a knife out of the kitchen. But she, you know, she had enough with responding to her kids. So she decided, I don't care if my kids cut each other up with kitchen knives or blow up the house. I'm going to meditate. And that's what she did, the hero. And things went quiet very quickly. And she had half an hour of meditation, that's all. And she opened her eyes the two kids were, you know, no wounds to them. The gas had been turned off. The, the house hadn't exploded. The kids were bluffing her. And she called their bluff. And they were just sitting quietly in the corner playing. And from that day onwards, whenever she sat down to meditate, the kids knew, her mummy's meditating, we can't do anything now. That's how you win your right to meditate. And also the kids realize after mummy meditates, she's a much nicer mummy afterwards. <laughs> and that's so true. So the peace that you have a bit of peace and quiet by yourself. Right, that, that's how it's done. Okay. There's about 40 minutes left. We just wanted to say, I wanted to say something about why I'm here this last two weeks. You know, because you know, in monastic Buddhism that even the Buddha, once he was fully enlightened, he made a vow. The Maoist gentleman I already mentioned to you tried to talk the Buddha into just not teaching anything. But just now you're enlightened, you can disappear. Because teaching people is a lot of pain. Organizing a monastery is really hard work. All the admin work and stuff. So they don't do that. Because people do it difficult to teach. And the Buddha said, no. He said, I will not enter Parinibbana and disappear from this world until, until I've established four communities. A community of fully ordained Buddhist monks who are enlightened. A community of fully ordained Buddhist nuns who are enlightened. A community of lay followers, men. A community of lay followers, women. When all those four communities are strong, so they can support one another. Now we support you in teaching and services, whatever we know we share. Now you support us in however you can help. Now we have rules of simplicity, of renunciation, not, not having any money, not sort of keeping food, 
Now we've got Riley left me days to feed us. You're doing very well with me, look at me. <laughs> not, no, you're not fat enough yet. <laughs> you can't say that. So please look after her. And what you're doing is, well, once that was established in India, then the Buddha said, well, yes, I've done my job, I kept my promise. These four communities were very strong and powerful. So you could enter that environment. The monks' community has done strong for so many centuries. But the bhikkhunis, fully ordained Buddhist nuns, where are they? It's been very difficult to have bhikkhunis. It's allowed. I know my rules of discipline. That's why other people object to bhikkhunis. They never argue with me. I know my stuff. So, it's allowable. There aren't enough bhikkhunis yet. I did a bhikkhuni ordination in Australia 13 years ago. Okay, thank you. That is legitimate. It's growing but not here in the UK. That's one of the reasons. This was where I was born. I was born in Park Royal Hospi Hospital in London. I grew up here. So that connection is still very strong here. And I told many people that after the Bikuni ordination, I forget exactly where, but one woman came up to me and said, things are very dark for women here in England. I remember that, I can't forget it. So when somebody says that to me, if I can, I do whatever I can to create that equity. There's equity in so many different parts of our world. Why not in Buddhism? What's wrong with having 40 ordained Buddhist nuns? And so basically, to me it's intolerable that we have that unfairness. So that's why been coming so many years trying to do something about it. That's why I ask you to help. That's why I ask you that in your lifetime, in my lifetime, we can have flourishing Buddhist monasteries for women as well as men. And I know, from, you, know you may think I'm wise, but I know there are some things which a bhikkhuni can teach, which I will never be able to teach, which I don't know. And so that's one of the reasons why it's imperative to have sort of that equity in our Buddhist tradition. That's why I ask you to please support bhikkhuni Chanda. How to support her is just, instead of just uh, saying, oh, how can I help? and then telling her all your problems, there's only one of her, and how many of you, after a while she gets burnt out. So please see how you can volunteer to help in this way and that way, especially to feel that there's a community here in UK supporting her. There's people she can turn to just for food for the day. Now it is allowable in times of emergency, for monks and nuns to cook their own food. But that's not a real thing, that's only emergency. So if you can find a time to actually to offer her a meal, find out exactly what she needs, because you can't take any garlic, because I can't take any chilli in my food. So you know, sometimes you take some and you get a very sore, sore stomach afterwards. So find out what she needs, and if you can find a way of offering it, even just spending a day down in Oxford where she is right now, it's not that far from Bristol. And then you can offer some food, find out what she wants, give you a blessing. And I know you'd love to spend more time down there, but please don't spend too much time. Otherwise, for her, the food costs many hours of her time giving counselling and being friendly to you. 
He's a very friendly nun, but being too friendly, you get burnt out. And in the future, that's supporting bhikkhuni chanda. How many bhikkhunis, all you ordained, Theravada Buddhist nuns, are there in UK? In the whole of UK? How many? One. Right in front of you. That's the burden she takes. And I don't know if she could. She's a fragile plant, as I said last night. So care for her, otherwise, they can very easily just run away because it's too much hard work. Not really running away, just been looking after herself. <laughs> so be caring, be careful. I just want to let you know that. And we only have this hall for another seven minutes. Okay, you want to say something? Yeah. Now? Okay, yeah. So don't talk too much because uh, afterwards we have to vacate the hall. Other, oh no, no, please stay a long time and I can go to jail. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, just want to thank Ajahn Hajjali, first of all, for your amazing support for all monastics, but also for taking yeah. that really brave and courageous, heartfelt ethical step to ordain or to facilitate the ordination of women, because this is so important for the strength of Buddhism everywhere. And also for supporting me. And by supporting me, it's not, it doesn't mean it's about me. And I'm just going to really make that clear. You may be coming to feed me now because I'm the only bikini. But the whole point is that this is for the Sangha to grow. So it's not about an individual. It's not about Adrian Brown. It's not about me. It's about starting community for everybody. Because among you now, I don't know if there's anybody with the remotest of monastic aspirations. There are some children, who knows? <laughs> but in the future, there will be women. And for women who don't see that possibility, then, of course, the aspiration cannot grow. But when there is a possibility, and when women are represented in the monastic form as well, then they can maybe see a path forward to develop in the monastic training way. And so this is really for the sake of the preservation and strength of Buddhism and to give more opportunities, not just to women, but to all people, especially people who feel more marginalized. One of the things I'm really proud about in this project is that I feel it attracts a greater diversity of people, um, different races, different colors, different genders, different age groups, and especially people who do feel marginalized, I think, certainly women. And, for myself as a bikini now, I've actually never felt so marginalized ever before. <laughs> because it's sad to say this in a religion like Buddhism, but there's still a heap of discrimination. Every day I hear about it, you know. Every day I hear about a friend of mine who easily found a place to meditate in the forest and there's all these huts there for them to go to. And I know I can't go to that place. This is like a daily thing for me that I hear this disparity. And so Ajahn gave me the opportunity, being a teacher that I'm very close to and have 100% trust in, to come over here and try to start something. And it is hard work. And I'm, I don't know if I use the word fragile. Certainly everybody in life is fragile. We're all human beings. We have our limits. I've worked very, very hard to start this. You know, it's been seven years and we've organized seven tours for Ajahn Brown mainly myself and one bookings volunteer. Now the community is growing and it's wonderful and we do lots of online teaching and things are getting a bit easier in that respect. And this year I was in Perth. I had the amazing opportunity to spend nearly eight months in your monastery, Aja, where I feel I belong. And I'm a, I'm a part of the community, but only ever as a visitor, being female. So, but I had a long retreat period there. And during that time, we actually purchased the first property owned by us. So we now have a small vihara, it's like a monastery, but a small one, in Oxford. So I just want to say that we've achieved a lot and we actually have a base now. So it's the beginnings, you know, even though there's been seven years leading to this, it's actually the beginnings of something concrete. So we have a place to meet and uh, of course, for you to come, offer dana if you can, or come and meditate, just come and spend some time, spend a week or even longer living in this place with me, and start to be part of this community, because that's what it's all about. 
and hopefully in that way we can offer another place of safety and sanctuary and a place for developing your practice because that's what it's really all about. Right? It's all about helping us to develop on the path of Buddhism, on the path of peace. So I'm hoping this can be not only a lot of work for me, but a gift of peace to many people, both now and in time to come. So it's a long-term project, you know, it might be several generations before we have like several noms, but I feel it's worth planting that seed because if somebody doesn't do this, nothing's going to happen, nothing's going to change. So yeah, it takes, you know, a strong person like Ajahn Brown to actually be an ally for bhikkhunis, but yeah, we also have to uh, pull together and, and yeah, honour that, in a sense. And since it is the last talk, I just want to thank you, Ajahn, from the depths of my heart for coming to England and offering your wisdom and kindness and compassion through so many teachings. We did an online retreat and we've done many teachings all over, actually, not all over England, but next year we'll do a little bit more. And uh, just for your commitment, you know, through thick and thin to this project for the sake of all beings. And also, I always get the applause, but now I think a nice round of applause for Venerable Chanda as well. She takes the hardest of all.